uh, let me say also in conjunction with my gratitude to them, uh, I don't have it all figured out. I don't want to suggest to you today <clears throat> that I understand the issues of the church's involvement in systemic injustice, racial injustice, uh, perfectly. However, I humbly submit to you today uh, the reason behind why our church engages these issues uh, in this way with the hope that uh, through our discussion today and in the carrying out of your ministry moving forward, you too uh, will consider it a biblical imperative uh, to see that your action, your civic engagement uh, parallels your fidelity to the scripture. And the passion uh, is the same therein. So uh, that is uh, my hope today uh, to cover that. And then we've got some time for a discussion when we're done. Uh, Danny, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna time myself. I, I wrote something uh, that I pitched to Christianity today. They denied it. Um, that kind of happens. Um, <laughs> and given the subject matter, I totally get it. Um, well, actually, I won't say they denied it. They accepted it. They just wanted me to change it. And then there comes a time when you like write from your heart. You don't want the editors to change what you got to say. So you just will live with it. And uh, and that's what I've done. All right. 20th century England, amid the wrecked ruin of the church's waning influence, a brilliant journalist, capable theologian, just a bright thinker by the name of G.K. Chesterton, someone you should read as often as you can, remarked these words, people are weary of hearing what they have never heard. I think such is the case uh, with the Chicago protests surrounding the murder of Laquan McDonald and some of the subsequent protests coming out in relationship to police brutality against African-American young men. By now, many of you have seen the images or heard of McDonald's untimely death at the hands of a rogue Chicago police officer. Who can escape the images of the young teen pelted down by a cop emptying a clip of 16 bullets? I want to suggest to you that more than bullets killed Laquan McDonald, however. A darkened heart empowered by a system that disregards the lives of black men, young black youth, murdered Laquan McDonald. This is the stark reality facing Chicago even today. This past weekend, as many young people protested at the MLK breakfast last Friday. And it is the low octane fuel propelling outrage in protests seen around the nation. To make matters worse, for 400 days, the city of Chicago and the incompetent state's attorney concealed the dash cam footage for reasons of political expediency. It was not until a judge ordered the city to release the video footage of, of Laquan McDonald's murder that Chicago officials began a meticulous janitorial effort to clean up their cover-up. Now, having come of age in Chicago, as I did, and I, let me say it in the way Stephen Spear puts it, in black Chicago, I'm quite familiar with her less than stellar record of police protection of black residents. And of course, whenever I say something like that, people immediately say, well, oh, this is the city of Obama. And this is the city of Oprah. And what about Michael Jordan? That's true. But it is also the city of John Burge, of Richard J. Daly, and of Gage Park. Officer Van Dyke actually fits in a continuum of systemic injustice infl inflicted upon black people by those in power. He is part of a larger narrative that has the authority to disregard black lives. He was long known as a loose cannon. In fact, um, and I don't necessarily want to get into details on this on camera, but one of the police officers at our church trained Officer Van Dyke and noted then that he was a person who did not follow the rules. It seems to us 
from personal encounter with Officer Van Dyke that the system knew of his ill regard and yet passed him along anyway. As we can tell from his personal and professional poverty of judgment, he cost the city more than $350,000 in moving from one precinct to the next, and yet he remained an officer. You might not know that Chicago's method of police discipline is kind of antiquated. Your record as a police officer does not follow you from one district to the next if you are reassigned until you retire. And then your collective record is held together. So Officer Van Dyke, along with others, are able to move from one precinct or district to another without feeling the cumulative discipline of their actions. But I wondered, even as we looked at the issue of Officer Van Dyke and the murder of Laquan McDonald, who is a complicated case, how many Christians, if given the opportunity, would be marching with us in Chicago? I think it's a worthy question in light of the sordid history of American evangelicalism. Whether you know it or not, American evangelicalism is known more for her defense of orthodoxy than she is a proponent of orthodoxy's twin, orthopraxy. That is at least as it plays out in matters of race in American society. Um, I, I really wanna do this. I really wanna talk about Donald Trump's visit to Liberty University the other day. The double standard, the incongruency with which we judge character and all of a sudden, the good people at Liberty don't care that he's been married three times, doesn't need to ask for forgiveness, and doesn't care about the foreigner or the stranger. He can say two Corinthians like Don Carson, but at least D.A. Carson's from Canada and has a reason to talk like that. He simply doesn't know his Bible. And yet, American evangelicalism will give Donald Trump a pass because he's running on the Republican platform. Don't get me wrong. There were some evangelicals swarming the magnificent mile the day after Thanksgiving when we marched in Chicago on Black Friday. They stood in collective protest with everybody else against the city's cover up. And I was one of them. How could I resist? This is a live illustration of how to get away with murder. And then, there was a Monday that many of you came down to march with us from our church to the local Chicago police headquarters. How could we resist doing that? For the most part, our church understands that the church has to lead in the conversation of justice because we are the only people who can talk about justice from a foundation upon which justice can stand. And that is righteousness. I'm most grateful that many of you came, in fact, some of our non-black Christian brothers and sisters to stand with us. And here is where Chesterton's words ring loud and true. There is an eerie silence among many Christians in these protests. And I think it is because some of us are weary of hearing what we have never heard. To those who feel like black America is misguided when it cries, black lives matter. Perhaps you should feel again. The superintendent of police, well, the then superintendent of police, and an indifferent state's attorney coalesced to protect a rogue officer. This is another affirmation of the insignificance of black lives in America. McDonald was a ward of the state. He was armed with a three inch blade and he was walking away from Officer Van Dyke, who alone fired 16 shots into a teenage orphan. What happened next is woefully gruesome. Almost instinctively, the Chicago police erased 80 minutes of security camera footage from the nearby Burger King and suppressed the story for 400 days. And had it not been for the court injunction, we would have never known about it. This friends, screams injustice. I want to suggest to you that this is a moral problem before it is a racial contention. 
The outrage in Chicago is a matter of righteousness and justice. For that reason, the American church ought to have something loud to say about it. What is our answer? What kind of Christian community sits by and silences its collective outrage over such blatant injustice? What church in America resumes normal Sunday morning services with no mention of this degradation? What Christian group, despite its ethnic orientation, fails to at least speak about it? I suggest that a failure to demonstrate leaves the appeal for justice to those who have no allegiance to righteousness. And yet many in our beloved community will do nothing, say nothing. And wherever you live, whether it's the backwoods of Nebraska or the cornfields of Indiana, a most appropriate Christian response is more than just sitting on the couch, watching the evening news and lamenting another tragedy while you keep quiet. I suspect that many of us are unmoved and don't say a thing because we have grown weary of hearing what we have never heard. We've grown weary of hearing black people cry for equity and for justice. We've grown weary of seeing other black people murdered on the streets. And yet we've not heard the demand of the gospel, which prompts you and I into action. It may not demand that you march in every demonstration, but it does convict in action. Both Testaments and early Christian history affirm that issues of mass injustice matter to God and by implication, they ought to matter to you and I. Now I propose that our implicit insistence that the Christian pulpit and pew is not the place to address matters of societal injustice is more of our American notion of the separation of church and state, not a biblical imperative. Now, this is no suggestion that our Christian witness de-emphasize the depravity of men's souls or the importance of man's unregenerate position. It is, however, a rejection that that kind of Christian silence that minimizes the situation that trap men's souls and their lives on earth is not biblical. If you have never heard the gospel, then you've got an excuse. But if you have heard the gospel, then you have heard a clarion call to protest injustice. There is one more. I learned something. I saw something. It was actually uh, quite alarming. While marching on Black Friday down the Magnificent Mile, I noticed a peculiar disassociation or dissociation between the generations. It is a palpable, actual, and far-reaching dissociation. The divide is not new, but it deserves your deliberate attention because you are young people who are about to lead the Christian stage. Converging in the one march were several groups that day. The first was led by the elder established black clergy in Chicago, and some of which are national figures who never get invited to preach at Trinity, which I totally, anyway. They were the veteran civil rights group. The others were millennial aged, disaffected, embittered people. At the beginning, there was an unspoken disenchantment among the young people. And as the march continued, it became an outspoken disagreement, more pronounced. And then as I stood there and watched, it was played out on national television. This was not a quarrel over philosophy. This was not a debate over strategy. It was rather a hatred of history. The young people that day, millennial aged, rejected the moral premise of the elders group. They were weary of hearing what they have never heard. They deserted a heritage that they never understood. They seemed obsessed with the kind of anti-clericalism and it broke my heart standing there. On deck is the emergence of a passionate, unchurched, unchristian generation. They are appropriately discontented by blatant racism in society. And even more conspicuous is that their indignation is uninformed by righteousness. They have not heard that where indignation is not righteous, its offspring will be worse than its offense. Righteousness must 
fuel our demand for justice. And this is why our Christian community should consider involvement. Because we've got a number of young people, BYP 100, Black Lives Matter, and many other groups who are protesting correctly, but they've not heard the reason for their own anger. No amount of infuriation will overcome a trespass if it is not grounded in holiness. Therein lies the mandate for the church. This is a timely opportunity for the church to reach our nation's young. And I think we ought to seize this opportunity to demonstrate that the gospel transforms every facet of human existence. The relationship between our human experience and the biblical text is in a word inescapable. We do not simply read the biblical passages, but the Bible reads us. The redemptive historical narrative is long, but it cares about justice. The church ought to equip her young to recognize the need for the prophetic voice of the gospel in these timely protests. To those under 35, the church can exhibit a gospel response to the death of Laquan McDonald and many like him. We can reclaim our witness to a generation that has not heard the power of truth. And as a starting point, I think Christians everywhere ought to denounce the injustice, this injustice in Chicago. People are weary of hearing what they have never heard. Those are my thoughts, and I'm sticking to it.